So that's that. But now that I've, we've talked about the election, I mean, this kind of rings true to some things. Like, you think about some of the movies in the past that some of you may have grown up, I guess Back to the Future, maybe in the 80s, Star Trek, right? That movie. It's, and these are a looper, right? These are all movies about sort of time travel, right? And, uh, you know, but God says you know, that he has made evident that he is the true God, right? We saw in Romans, Romans 1, right? He says, based on the things he has created, right? And he talked about, in, in, he put it in man, right, to know, right? So man has enough information. He said, but as man gets more intelligent, it actually makes it just more inexcusable, right? The more we know, the more inexcusable it becomes. Like people, now we discover, you know, DNA and all these different things, right? And, uh, you know, telescopes that can see the, I don't know how many quadrillions of stars there are out there in the world, right? And all this stuff lines up with the Bible, right? And so it just makes it, you know, life being in the blood. And back in the day, they used to actually drain the blood, right? It's inexcusable to deny the God of the Bible, right? Right? Yet evolution and Big Bang is still, you know, again, it still exists. But let's look at something. Let's look at the three theories of time travel, okay? So there's uh, what they call fixed time, right? So let's read what fixed time is all about. Oh, here comes trash truck here uh fixed time right in a fixed timeline even when a party travels back in time the future they left cannot be changed right all events remain as fixed points in time the action of the traveler in the past has already become part of history that is known as uh non non viscoff self-consistency pr principle so the examples really help you right say you travel back in time in order to kill adolf hitler as a baby in order to prevent World War II. You replace them with the orphan baby so that the family will not notice. You travel back to time, back to the future, and the replaced baby grows up to become Adolf Hitler himself. You're in a loop, you can't escape. It's like saying you're you're in a loop, you can't escape it, right? So that's that's one fix, that's one principle, right? Dynamic timeline. In a dynamic timeline, altered events in the past have definite impacts on the present. For example, if you travel back in time and kill your grandfather, you also prevent your own birth and your eventual trip back in time in turn. Yeah, oh, okay. So you also prevent your own birth and your eventual trip back in time, right? So in turn, your grandfather is never killed, right? Because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, if you kill your grandfather, you prevent your own birth. And if you prevent your own birth, you couldn't have went back to kill your own grandfather. So in turn, your grandfather is never killed and you are born again. What? They use the word born again. Only to go back in time and kill your grandfather anyway. Right? So now you're in a loop. They're like, this is a continual loop. You can't get out of it, right? So they talk about that. And that's like in Back to, back to the Future. Let's look at multiverse, right? The concept of a multiverse supports altern alternate timelines. So they kind of have two timelines on there, but they say infinite. But they can say it could be two timelines. They say in a number of parallel universes, traveling into the past causes a new divergent timeline from the first, right? Because of this, the traveler can do anything with impunity. Basically, you know, you travel back in time, right? And, but it's a but it's a different it's like a different timeline right and because you're um on this different timeline the traveler can do anything with impunity and only the new timeline will be affected right so it's because it's parallel timelines right it's not like you destroy it or even infringe or overlap the other timeline it's like a whole it's like a concurrent or parallel timeline right um so, so only the new timeline will be affected. If you travel back in time and kill all your grandparents, it's morbid examples, nothing happens, right? There's no paradox. You have simply created a new timeline in which you will not exist, but the original timeline is unaffected. However, you cannot return to the, your original timeline, right? So let's read that again. Nothing happened. There's no paradox. You have simply created a new timeline in which you will not exist, but the original timeline is unaffected, right? However, you cannot return to the original timeline, right? So this is very interesting, right? So let's let's look at this and I'm gonna ask you a question, okay? 
You got the fixed timeline, the dynamic timeline, and the multiverse, right? Let's read Galatians 2.20. The question for you is, which scenario best matches the Bible? Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Right? So the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right? And then John 14.12 says, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he do also in greater works than these because I go to the Father. So basically it's saying, you know, though you live, Christ lives. Yeah, I live, not I, but Christ. So I live, but not I, but Christ lives. And the works that Christ does, now I do, right? Because I was reborn in Christ. But yet, I'm still alive. Which does that match? Does that match uh, the fixed timeline? No, because in the fixed timeline, you end up still being a sinner, right? Right? If you were to do something that you thought affected the first timeline, you killing yourself means you wouldn't have existed to kill yourself, so thus you're born. So that doesn't work. The dynamic timeline is somewhat similar because it's, 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 a, it's a loop, right? Right? Because in the first timeline, you would have still came back as a sinner, right? Because it's a fixed timeline, right? Um, you thought, well, I'm going to be a sinner. I'm going to go back and kill myself and start over and try to work a, walk a perfect life. Well, then you're reborn and you only grow up to be the same sinner that you always were. Dynamic timeline. Uh, dynamic timeline, right? It says um, you travel back in time and kill your grandfather, right? And also prevent your own birth and you eventually trip back to the time. In turn, your grandfather is never killed and you're born again only to go back in time to kill your grandfather anyway. So that's the loop. So this doesn't work, right? Because you'd be trapped in an infinite loop and there's no way you can get out of it. And so you'd just be going through life over and over and over and over and over again. What some people would like to call reincarnation. But, but that doesn't work because you're, you're doing this paradox because you're it's not like you can learn it's not like you're learning the lesson from the other stuff you're still just being born over and over and over again as as a human in your same body so it doesn't work but multiverse look at that so this one it's got you can have a dual parallel universe right right you travel in the past and it causes a new divergent timeline right from the first because of this the traveler can do anything without impuni with, with impunity, right? So imagine this happening, but you travel back in the past because now, according to the scriptures, you're born of the Spirit. And you travel back in the past. You're known by the Father, the Spirit, and of course the Son through the via the Son, and you come back, and now you live the perfect life through Jesus Christ, right? And you're no longer under the law, so it's, it's it's without impunity in the sense that you're no longer under the law because now God doesn't consider you to exist in your old flesh, right? So though your old flesh is on the previous timeline, on the other universe in the world, right? The other part of you that's reborn is not of this world, right? And is on a separate timeline. It's in, it's in eternity, right? Whereas the part of you that's trapped in time, space, and matter that's still living um, dies off and that part's to destroy it. So it doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't impact you, right? So you can do things without impunity in your flesh because the part that's in the other timeline in the parallel universe is actually sealed in Christ and no sin can get to get inside Christ, right? So hopefully that makes sense, right? So really the scenario that the Bible actually describes is called the multiverse, right? And this Bible is what, an old book? <laughs> like, it's not like God was saying, you know, I'm going to try to do something to really impress these guys, you know? This is written in the Bible, right? The multiverse um, concept is exactly Galatians 2.20,
in John 14, 12. Right? It's exactly that scenario. Right? You, you, you believe in Jesus Christ. You're sealed in the Spirit. You're in the Spirit, which goes back before the beginning of time, before you even born. You're reborn, but this time you're hidden in Christ. And in Christ, there's no sin. So now you're sinless. But though you're still alive in the other universe, the parallel universe, but you're considered dead to the flesh as far as because that universe cannot impact the other universe. So that's why it's dead to the flesh because those two can't meet. They can't converge. And so no matter what sin you quote unquote did, you're no longer under the law. You're no longer under sin. So you can what you do, you do it without impunity because who can lay charge to God's elect, right? God will have mercy on who he will have mercy. So, again, the Bible is from God. I mean, it, not that I needed this to prove that the Bible is from God, but if it's not evident that the Bible is, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's, am it's amazing. Like, that's God's word. Make no mistake about it. And, you know, this isn't in the Quran. This isn't in any of these other quote unquote books. And see, the funny thing about it, right? Those other quote books, they want to take what the first, the first five books or whatever, but they don't want. But they didn't want the the, the the New Testament. Well, guess what? This is all in the New Testament, right? And but it's not just in the New Testament. Actually, it's in the old. It's in Isaiah too, right? It's in Isaiah and it's in the Old Testament because the, the words, it got God wrote His word. All of it fits together beautifully, which is why, you know, it's like a fine thread. You know, that's just paints this beautiful picture and it all reconciles. But when someone tries to change it, that's why you have these contradictions uh, from the different different Bibles, right? So let's let's talk about this a little bit more. Like John 14 says, if you had known me, you know my father also. And from henceforth, you know him, right? That's that parallel universe and has seen him. And the works that I do, you do also. And greater works because I return to the Father. That means you're imputed the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, which is obviously... Um, uh, eternal in Christ he had lived 33 years but then returned to the Father who is also eternal but for, from a man's perspective you're imputed the work of Christ as a man and then Galatians 20 which says I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live not I but Christ liveth in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me right so that's the the um, impunity because Jesus Christ in the alternate timeline, he's the one who's um, lived the sinless life and in the spirit where there is no sin in God, right? But then we look at 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, right? For his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God, right? It totally makes sense because again, you're sealed in Christ, right? And we saw that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled by our faith in Jesus Christ and the law of the schoolmaster to bring us into Christ. But once we're in Christ, we're no longer under the law. Thus, uh, you cannot sin in the spirit, right? First Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he that made us, made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Totally makes sense, right? Imputed righteousness. And that's why it says all things are new, right? But all things are new, but there's these old things which God considers to be passed away, right? So we were born again in the spirit, 1 Peter 1, 21, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So there you are. You're born of incorruptible seed, right? And that seed cannot commit sin, according to 1 John 3, 9, which is verified here because it says incorruptible and it liveth and abideth forever, right? And then you get the glorified body, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. 53 for this corruptible must put on incorruptible and this mor mortal must put on what immortal we get the score five body again and so that's the all things new and then it says we're what crucified with christ and dead to the flesh yet we live right so the carnal flesh is mortal romans 8 20 and if christ be in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness right so that old flesh though it still lives it's dead right because of sin so we have the two natures the new versus the old man right romans 7 for our delight that paul wrote for our delight in the law of god after the inward man now he's talking that's the spirit man but i see another law in my members that's the outward man the carnal man 
warring against the law of my mind, right? We renewed my mind and bring me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Apostle Paul must not have believed in progressive sanctification. He's talking about how he has this law of sin. He's writing this in Romans 7. He's not some new baby Christian. He's talking about how he still sins. And he's saying, you know, there's this flesh that does one that goes works against his spirit, right? And he says this flesh brings him into captivity of the law of sin, which is in his members. And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through what? Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that with the mind, I must serve the law of God, right? But with the flesh, the law of sin, parallel universe, right? Parallel universe, right? One's sinning still. One is not because it's sealed in Christ and it operates with, without impunity because it's no longer under the law. Amazing. So we understood that, that all things new, right? And the old things. And the KJV, again, 3.9 says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. We understand why that's true. 5.21 said, For he that made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, right? That's the fact, right? Jesus became sin so that we could be sinless, and we're born of God's seed. We get the Holy Spirit. There's no sin in the Holy Spirit. There's no sin in Christ. Thus, we, be, we cannot sin from the Spirit. But look at the satanic perversions that claim God produces bad seed. This is the NIV, NLT, ESV, NASB. They perverted it to teach works and progressive sanctification lie. Listen to NIV, 1 John 3, 9. No one that's born of God will continue to sin. Because God's seed remaineth in him, they cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Well, the part that's born again is what? The spirit. Right? And then you have a glorified body. So total perversion doesn't make sense. Uh, that's a lie. James White is a lie. All the people who support these Bibles are either, either fooled. They're, well, they're, they're liars no matter what, whether they mean to or not. And they're, and they're deceived. NLT, those who have been born in God's family do not make a practice of sinning because his life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning. Progressive sanctification again, but it's a lie. See how they're lying to you? ESV, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning. A lie. NESB, no one is born of God practices sin because the seed abides in him. He cannot sin. So you can practice sin, but then you cannot sin. Total lie, total fabrication, total perversion of God's word. And again, we talk about the thread of God's words, the beauty of it in 11. You know, uh, when you do something, when you change one part of God's word, it's going to not reconcile the other parts. Let's look at Psalm 89, 26. He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him my firstborn. It's talking about Jesus, right? Higher than the kings of the earth, right? King of kings, Lord of lords. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore and my covenant right right seed of abraham right shall stand fast with him right jesus christ no other name given under heaven right if his children right we're the seed right those who believe the gospel forsake my law right and walk not in my judgments when we were told to walk worthily and i just showed you the verse is talked about if you don't walk worthy, many of you are weak, many of you are sick, and some of you sleep. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, because we're not under the commandments, right? But it's saying, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod, right? God chastens every son that he receives. And their iniquity, iniquity with stripes, right? Spoil the, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. Nevertheless, listen to this. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithful faithfulness to fail. Now do you see why the faith of Christ is needed in the Bible? Now you see why it makes sense? Because the Lord's faithfulness will never fail, right? Now you understand when it's done in James 2, when it says, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with respect to person why it makes sense, right? 
but it's so perverted these guys have done so it's just such there should be outrage over these bibles for anyone who's a quote-unquote pastor if you have a pastor and you guys are going to a church and they're using a, the, another bible you should just bring it up to them say why look here's some contradictions right here and i know this kjv doesn't kind of why are we using these other perverted bible versions you know, people will come up with all kinds. You can't listen to these liars. You know, they're proud. And what it is, is these guys really do think they're right. They think they're right. They, I guarantee you, you can show them this video, how it, how it reconciles. There's no contradictions. And in their mind, they'll say, oh, there's a contradiction. There, the, but there's no contradiction here, what, what, we're, what we're going through. None. Right? Totally reconciles from the KJV. Right? But you can show it to them, and they're just gonna. A lot of them are just gonna write it off, right? Because they're blinded by vanity, by pride. They just don't. Some people just don't want to believe the gospel for what they just don't want to believe the gospel according to Romans, or I think Romans one it says they just don't want to believe from due to vanity, right? And so the faith of Christ is essential because. It just goes to show that even after we believe, even if we turn faithless, we're still sealed in the faith of Christ, right? So that's why it says, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail, my covenant will I not break, right? It's for his glory, right? It's his glory. And the way you glorify God is believing on Jesus Christ and that's it. You don't glorify God by trying to... Um, think that your salvation you, you're going to lose your salvation if you don't have fruits or if you uh, keep the law because basically what you're saying then is you know what Jesus Christ your sacrifice was insufficient right that's what you're saying so this, but here's the thing the satanic versions changed psalm seed to offspring in ESV and just they changed the descendants in the ESV and NLT or just take it out completely in NIV right so they even go back and try to change some. But here's the thing. Like you said, well, wait a minute. Offspring and seed or descendant and seed, those are the same. Well, here's the thing. When you study the Bible, if you study like I study, like you go through and you you look up keyword searches, right? You'll do a keyword search. Say you got a cord or whatever. You do a keyword search. But if Satan has changed seed to offspring, how are you going to understand the context and know how to go back and find that verse in context to know what it means? You're not. If you're looking for seed, you're not going to see seed. You know, seed and offspring are two different words. God is so precise in what he did. He used seed for a reason in certain places, and he may have used offspring for in certain places for a certain reason. He used complete in certain places and perfected in certain places. God did it all on purpose. God did not make a mistake. You know, God did it all on purpose. So this is kind of long, but, you know, it's kind of the summary. Like, we know that sin requires death because it separates from God and we're strangers and foreigners, right? And so about without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But we know we've all sinned. We all deserve hell. We're all disobedient by the law. And we need the imputed righteousness of Jesus, right? Uh, and, and But, you know, we know that Jesus said, you know, you know, had Adam and Eve not done what they did, right? To obey is better than sacrifice, right? Because had Adam and Eve listened, then there would be no need for God to have clothed them with the with the, with the skin of an animal, right? Right? So to obey would be better than sacrifice because had they had we not had we all obeyed or had Adam not disobeyed and had we all obeyed, then there would be no need for a sacrifice because where there's no offense, there's no uh there's no, uh, but there's no offense and no law. There's no sin, and if there's no sin, there's no need for the remission of blood, right? Uh, but John twenty eight says, and they sent, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, and I do always those things that he pleases pleases him right so to obey is better than sacrifice who's the one who obeyed and did everything the god father told him to do jesus christ john 17 4 right it says i glorify thee on earth i have finished the work which thou gavest me to do right he always did it really really i said he that believed on me the works i do he should do also right so that's how we can be pleasing right it says if you love me keep my commandments right 
Who kept the commandments? Love fulfills the law, right? Love covers the multitude of sin. So Jesus kept the commandments because he loved the Father. If you love me, keep my commandments. Then Jesus loved us because the love covers the multitude of sins, right? And God committed his love towards us and he showed us his love and his mercy via Jesus being our sacrifice, right? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, right? So now he's saying, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, right? Because, you know, again, same thing with Isaac, right? Jesus is, is a perfect sacrifice. Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world, right? He was wounded for our transgression, right? Preached for our iniquities. By his stripes, we are healed. But once you believe the gospel, you're saved by grace through faith on Jesus, born again, are no longer a stranger to God, but known to God forever. False religions say you can lose your salvation if you do or don't do whatever it is. It doesn't matter. If, if they don't say you're saved once you believe the gospel and that's it, period, you're done. No water baptism, no nothing. You just believed. Right? You can sit there and just in your chair and just believe. Right? No, oh, you got to bear fruit, stop sinning, get baptized in water, repent from sin, etc. In short, they don't believe that the instant you believe the gospel, you are saved forever. You have everlasting life. They don't believe it. That's why Calvinists hate John 3, 16, right? Matthew 23, right? This is before Jesus went to the cross. He said, woe to you Pharisees and you're hypocrites. Like you pay tithes of men, and and human, right? Because this is, again, before he went to the cross, you admitted the waiting matters of the law, judgment, right? Mercy and faith, right? The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to the cross because of the law, no flesh will be justified. That's what we're all considered guilty. We understand that we need Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, the life, right? And he was sinless, perfect sacrifice. And we just need to put our faith on him, uh, on him and we shall be saved. That's it, right? Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sins, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, right? It's so beautiful that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. We walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And because they didn't believe on the finished work of Jesus Christ, they really didn't believe the gospel, as proven by their claims that if you are saved, you would do or stop doing X, Y, Z which they may call fruits, but really it's just works, right? Titus 1.16 talks about this, right? They profess they know God, right? And we saw how you, you just believe and you have access by the Spirit, right? But it says, but in their works they deny Him. Why is it in their works they deny Him? It's because they think they got to do something, right? And when you got to do something or, or maintain something or not do something to be saved, then you've rejected the sacrifice wholesale, right? So that's why it says you're being abominable and disobedient and never under every good work reprobate. Matthew 7, 22 says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in the name and do all these cast out devils and in that name do many wonderful works? Now I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. Right? That makes sense, right? Because again, you're working iniquity. Iniquity comes by the law. That's a person who didn't believe the gospel who thought they needed to do something else beyond believing the gospel. Right? So that, that is definitely confusing. Right? For people. But there's one meter between God and man, and that is Jesus, right? It's not going to happen with Back to the Future. You know, Star Trek's a nice fantasy with a spaceship and more wormholes and all that kind of stuff. Looper's really cool and caters to our ego. I guess if, you know, like the, uh, what's that movie uh, called? Uh, is it called Jane with Charlize Theron? Where it kind of shows the, the, oh no, Lucy. You know, the Lucy, the first supposed first uh, woman specimen found. Right? There's, there's all this stuff. We're not going to um, traverse into parallel universes uh, based on our own intellect. God pretty much tells us that, right? If you look at the story of Lazarus, I won't go through all this, right? But you know the story how, you know, there's a beggar, Lazarus, right? And there's this rich man. And, you know, um, they both died. But Lazarus was comforted because he, basically Lazarus went to heaven and the, and the rich man went to hell. And, you know... The, the rich guy said, he cried for mercy, said, send Lazarus, that he may dip tip of his fingers in the water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But it's kinda, that's kind of pompous of him, right? He's in hell, he's still trying to boss the guy around. But Abraham, Abraham said, son, remember thou in thy lifetime received thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, he received like evil things. He didn't have good things, right? But now he is comforted and thou art tormented, right? And 
besides all this, between us, there's this great gulf fix, right? So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that come from thence. So that's an important thing. There's not gonna, we're not gonna pass from hence to there, right? It's appointed to man once to die then the judgment. That's when you're gonna pass. And then you're gonna either pass from, from, from life or you're gonna pass to death. That's the only choice you have. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went up from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one of one rose from the dead. Remember, uh, the Bible says the Jews seeketh the sign, the Greeks seeketh wisdom, right? And I think, you know, a lot of these false religions, the Calvinists, they seeketh the sign, right? They definitely seeketh the sign because they want to see your fruit, right? To prove your savior, prove your sanctification. And they definitely seeketh wisdom because they just keep going back to the books. So, but out of all that, they're still deceived, right? But the corrupt time matter space ends because in Isaiah 51, 6, it says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look up to the earth beneath, for heaven shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they shall dwell in it. They that dwell there shall, shall die like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished, right? Because we are not of this world. Revelation 21 it talks about how etern the eternal eternity prevails, right? Eternal life prevails. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from the God of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So when you think about it, John 17, 5, who was there? Who was the elect servant called, right, and given before the foundations to bring righteousness, right, and judgment to the Gentiles via the Holy Spirit? Well, John 17 says, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the glory, before the world was, right? It's Jesus. John 17, 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with you where I am, right? And to see my glory and the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world, right? That's talking about foreknown because you loved me before the creation of the world. And where we're in Jesus Christ, who always obeyed the Father, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then who loved us, right? Love covers a multitude of sins. And then the Father who instructed us commanded all men to repent and believe. Then we love God, right? We love God. We're considered, we, we're sealed in him. We love God, right? We love God. So that's foreknown, right? Because you love me before the creation of the world, foreknown relationship, right? Isaiah 48 says, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever, right? You know, there's definitely, um, there's definitely um, a conspiracy, so to speak. And there's always a conspiracy with the devil, right? The devil's definitely conspiring to take away the word of God, to change the word of God, you know? And a lot of people are falling for it, man. A lot of people are falling for it. Um, I've had discussions and I, I, I'm learning to dust my feet off and keep moving, but on YouTube where you, you show people salvation is by grace through, faith, grace through faith, it's a gift, it's not of works, to he that worketh not, you know, it's it's by his stripes we are healed. Um, you, you can show them all your debt to the flesh, debt to sin, debt to the law. Uh, you're no longer of this world. Uh, we're crucified with Christ. They, you can tell them everything and they'll still say, well, you got to keep the commandments. You got to keep the commandments. You know? And it, it's, it's, it's horrible. But um, the word's being taken away because people want something easy to read. 
But the devil will give you something easy to read. They'll send you to hell in a second. Or the devil will give you a convoluted doctrines of men philosophy called Calvinism and Arminianism and give you that so you can study it and go to hell at the end of the day. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's amazing, right? This is in Revelation. This is God saying, Look, you know what? I've declared these things. Come, right? Come freely. But you know, there's a thing. You can't rob God. And the way you rob God is that anytime you say or think or do or whatever uh, pertains to salvation, that, that Jesus Christ was insufficient. That is something else that you need to do for salvation. And that's just not true. That's just not true. Right? So Titus 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect Jesus. Right? Look at that. Faith of God's elect Jesus. Look that up in the new version see if it's still there. Right? Okay. So he says, Apostle of Paul, Jesus Christ, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect Jesus. So it's according to Jesus, right? Tells you right there. And the acknowledging of the truth, right? You either believe. Pilate said, what is truth? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, right? And you have this new covenant, right? You have to believe the gospel. The acknowledge of the truth, which is after godliness, right? So there's no sin that those are in Christ Jesus. In hope of eternal life, which um, God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, right? But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior right through preaching right through preaching right that's something people hear the gospel you think about Ephesians 1 13 through 14 it talks about after you heard the word of truth right right First Corinthians 2, right? He's talking about through preaching. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. At the crux of the matter, why do people go to hell? Of sin because they believe not on me. What is the gospel? It's about the life, death, burial, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith alone. That's it. Right? That is it. And so... That's why Apostle Paul can say, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we can learn from the scriptures. But at the end of the day, what saves people? Believe in the gospel. And do you have to be some great scholar to understand that? No. Right? You just, you can tell, you can tell people the gospel, right? And uh, that's the most important thing is the gospel. Because that's, that's what brings God glory, right? That brings God glory. So, I mean, that's pretty much it, I think. Um, you know, I just want to say Jesus saves. And, you know, if you haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, I, again, I know this is a long video, but um, I thought it was important to cover. And I made sure I shortened it and do a shorter version. But um, I just thank the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation. And, uh, you know, all glory goes to God, right? And to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, because, you know, we're to preach Christ and elevate Christ talk about Christ I mean we don't have to be trying to talk about these doctrines of men so I try not to concentrate too much on other religions I figure just to preach what's true and let let that work it out right because um, you know you shed light on darkness and, and darkness has to flee right but um, it's totally you know it's totally beautiful you know the um, what Jesus did for us right and uh, again you you um, can become elect just by believing the gospel, right? By believing the gospel. You know, believe on the life, death, burial, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. You know, sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and thou shalt be saved, right? 
And then once you're saved, walk worthily. Tell other people about salvation. You know, no one's endorsing abusing God's grace going on to sin so the grace may abound. What we're saying is Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient that his blood paid for all of our sins, not some of our sins, to where we need to go and put the work in at any point in time because it's to he that worketh not, right, but believes on him, right, that justifies who? The ungodly. And that's us. We're the ungodly, right? So no one's saying go out and make an excuse to do what you want. We're simply saying believe the gospel and that when you believe the gospel, it is actually finished, period. Right? So um, I hope that helps. And um, any comments, that's fine.